see, I was about to say, OK, so, right? So we're not going to do that. I'm going to try to avoid that. OK. Today we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off on Monday, talking about doing query planning, query optimization. So on Monday, the, the lecture was really about how do you search for a good plan. And we've been ignoring how to calculate the cost. So that's what we're still going to focus on today. And so we'll talk about how to do cost models and then use those models to, to compute an estimation of what we think the quality of a plan is. And then I'll spend a little bit of time at the end just sort of talking about some ideas or things you should consider when you work in a large code base. And these are mostly things that I've sort of found useful for myself. Um, and so we can talk a little bit about what, what, why it's important and what, what things you need to worry about. OK, so again, on Monday, it was really about just enumerating over as many plans as we can, using heuristics, using transformation rules to convert a, a logical plan that was generated by our, our, our parser and planner, and then coming up with, with what we think is the optimal execution strategy for a particular query. And we said that we were going to ignore the OLTP stuff because, for the most part, heuristics are good enough for those guys, and it's really simple. Uh, it's a really simple transformation. You just find the index that has the, the attribute that you want to look up on, the best selectivity, and you choose that, and chances are that's, that's good enough. So what we're really talking about here is how do you deal with sort of complex queries, things with joins, nested subqueries, and, and things like that. And so again, the important thing also to remember is that the, all the estimates that the optimizer is going to generate for its various query plans are only useful internally. So they're not going to be based on something like the wall clock time or something that's external to the system. It's only really useful inside the optimizer to be able to say that this particular query plan is better than another one. And we'll see how we can sort of um, extrapolate metrics that we can capture about the execution, run, execution of, of queries to, to provide this what these estimates actually are. Um, and so everything that we'll talk about today for cost models is completely independent of what search scheme or what search strategy we, we would use from the lecture on Monday. Right? Obviously, the heuristic thing, since that's just sort of you know, using rules to, to, to you know, how to do transform a query, that doesn't really have a cost model. But like, whether we're doing the system R style, the, the, the genetic algorithm, the sim simulated annealing, the volcano cascade style optimizer, all, right, all of those things can use the cost models we're going to talk about here today. Right? And they just have sort of different properties, different characteristics of how how they search for, for the plans. All right, so within a cost model, I guess the high idea of a cost model, again, is, is the, a way to compute a, an analytical model of what we think the, 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 the experience the data system will have, what resources it would use as it executes a particular query. And so there's three different sort of components we can include in our cost model to allow us to make this decision. So the first one's kind of the obvious one, and it's just basically the physical resources, the physical re consumption of, of either CPU cycles or memory that we're going to have to use in order to execute the query. So this means that our model is going to want to be able to predict how many cycles we think we're going to use, how many cache misses. Uh, obviously, if we were a disk-oriented system, we would count the, you know, estimate the number of uh, blocks we're going to have to read from disk. Um, and so the reason why we want to do this as an analytical model and try to predict this is because if we had to actually maybe do, uh, you know, execute every single plan to see how, it, how fast it was, it would take forever because we, we may be looking at thousands or possibly millions of different plans during our, 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 our optimization phase. So the physical costs are nice because it sort of captures exactly how long the, we think the query is going to take. Uh, but the problem is that it depends heavily on the underlying hardware. So then what I mean by that is if you have, say, an older CPU that maybe not have all the optimizations our newer ones have, even though the cycles may be the same, it's not going to have possibly the same, like, low, the same cache sizes, the same replacement policy, and therefore this newer hardware may have a dr dramatically different um, uh, cost model than, than, than the older hardware. So the, the next approach is the, to try to calculate the logical cost for executing the query. So this is usually encapsulated in just estimating the size of the, of the result, of the number of tuples in the result that the operator is going to generate. Um, and this is usually independent of the actual what algorithm you're using. Right? So if I do a hash join versus a nested loop join, it doesn't matter that you know, one may be better than the other. They're always going to produce the same answer. The tuples may not be in the same order. We don't care about that. Um, 
And so that, in order to do this, though, we need to have estimations for the, the, the amount of data that's going to come out of each, each operator. And we could use that as the, as the input for the next operator. And then that will determine what we think is going to happen. And as I'll see as we go along, this is really heavily dependent also on what the data looks like and what our predicates look like. Um, and this is what most people do, and this is, but this has a lot of problems. And the last one is just computing like from like a, a you know, big O notation what we think the, the, the execution cost will be for a particular algorithm. So in that case, we know that nested loop is probably going to be slower than a hash join. Therefore, we would always want to choose a hash join. Um, but this doesn't help us for things like uh, you know, what order we want to get things. It just tells us what algorithm we may want to, may want to choose. So the, in a disk-based system, their cost model is super easy. Okay? It's always going to be disk I.O. Right? When you take an intro course and we talk about oh, you know, cost models in, 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 in that class, we're always assuming that it's going to be I.O. because we're assuming that we have a disk-based system. And that's really easy to do um, in, a, in a database system if you have complete control over the, the buffer management of the system. Right? Because this, the disk is so slow, e even if it's an SSD, uh, that means all the, the, the any kind of CPU or memory overhead is negligible to the the the, the IOs because that's going to be the main bottleneck. So because we have because we're controlling the, the the buffer manager, we know what the database system's replacement strategy and pinning rules and and all these other things. We know how it's going to move data in and out of memory, right? So in, in a predictable way, so we can include that in our cost model when we make calculations. Um, and most of the times, you also assume that you have exclusive access to the disk, and you don't have to worry about things getting swapped out that, uh, that, that you put in there. Like you, you wouldn't fetch a page and then be surprised that it's not there, because you're, you're controlling what comes in and out. So now, in a in-memory database, however, it's a lot more complicated, because we don't have a disk anymore. Right? Now we have to account for the, the CPU and memory costs, both in terms of the num number of cycles that we're spending, and, and also in terms of the number of uh, you know, fetches we get from, from the memory controller. I'll also say, too, that the, the, in, a, in, a, in a distributed database system, they don't have, you know, disk I.O. Isn't, isn't the same issue, isn't as big of an issue in a distributed system. Their problem is network I.O. So in, in, a, in a distributed system, you can just substitute disk I.O. for network I.O., and you basically get the same, the same result, or you try to reduce the amount of network traffic. So in a disk-based system and a distributed system, it's really easy. Again, but in the end memory system, we have to now account for more fine-grained things. So the difficulty with this is that, unlike before in a disk-based system where we were controlling our cache, now we're relying on the CPU's cache. And that's completely outside of our, of our control. Because right? the CPU is making decisions of how things move from L1 to L2, L3. We can you know, touch pages and try to pull things or prefetch. Uh, but we don't have the fine-grained control that we have in a disk-based system. So that means that we have a repl uh, uh, cache replacement strategy we don't control. We, don't keep, we can't pin things in our low-level caches. And then we also have to deal with the, the non-uniform memory access latencies. Right? If you try to have a thread that accesses something in a different NUMA region, that's going to be much slower than if something was local to you. Now, this last one here, we can kind of account for this. Uh, but this is typically not done in, in the, the, the cost model. Right? We saw in the case of the hypersystem with morsels, when they computed the plan uh, that had to touch data that was all in these different NUMA regions, it wasn't the cost model that was figuring out, oh, yeah, I'll, I have this cost because I know I can have these threads execute at these NUMA regions. It was really after you've generated the plan, then in, in the scheduling phase is when they would figure out how to account for this. Um, so typically, you, you, you basically ignore this, and you do all this later on. So, for most in-memory databases that I'm aware of, the way they're going to handle this is just always uh, estimate the number of tuples that are going to be processed per operator. And that's going to be our, our cost model. That's, that's the metric that we're going to care about. So we're, this sort of encapsulates both the, the memory and the CPU overhead without having to get to real you know, fine grain, um, you know, fine, doing fine grain measurements of, of, different, of these different parts. Right, so this is what Hecaton does. This is what MemSQL does. This is what Altabase does. This is what VoltDB does. They're all going to basically estimate how many tuples that we're going to, am I going to have to process. Um, and for all, pretty much every single operator, you can have a good estimate of like, given my input, 
given a certain selectivity, here's the, here's the number of tuples I, I plan to process, and here's what I plan to, uh, here's what I plan to put out. Right? And then you can use that as the input for the next operator. So one, more, uh, one complex cost model that deviates from the disk I.O. one and the, the in-memory one that I think is kind of interesting comes from Smallbase. So Smallbase was one of the first in-memory databases that came out of the 1990s. Uh, it was actually originally developed in HP Labs. Then they spun it off into a separate company that became Times 10, and then Oracle bought Times 10 in 2006. Uh, so the, what they would do is they would have sort of this two-phase approach where the database developer, so the person actually building the database system itself, they would identify all the sort of low-level primitives or operations that a execution engine would do as it processes a query. Uh, things like, you know, what's the cost of evaluating a predicate? What's the cost of pr probing an index? And they sort of come up with all these low-level things. And then when the system started up, they would run a bunch of sort of sample queries that, that would capture or cover all the things you identified in the first phase and then sort of get a rough estimate of what it costs for each of these, right? Sort of like, you know, getting, doing a micro benchmark for, for each of them. Uh, sort of like you think of like BOGO MIPS when, when you start up Linux. Um, and so what would happen is it would use the measurements that it collected during this profiling phase to then feed into the formulas that it would use to estimate the cost of a query. Right, so it would say, well, I, I, my table size is this, my selectivity on my predicate is this, therefore I, I anticipate that I'm going to process these number of tuples, and for each of, these, each of these steps in the processing, I know I'm going to execute X number of these primitives, and now since I know the CPU cost, because I, I benchmark them, I have a good estimate of what, what the execution cost is for the query. All right, so I kind of like this. This is sort of tying in like, the actual what the hardware can do without baking in constants from, from the application developer. Um, but I, I, the sense is I think this is overblown and nobody actually does this. I don't, I'm not even sure if Times 10 still does this. Yes? Yes. What the number of cache misses is, unless you sort of know the working set size and what in the order in which things are going to get executed. Right. So, right. so his statement is uh, for for this, the the in memory databases are just going to estimate the number of tuples of process per operator, but this doesn't account for anything like cache misses, prefetching, all the low level hardware stuff. And the answer is yes, correct. And the reason is, yes, you could be more fine grain. Uh, in your cost model estimations, uh, but as we'll see later on the, the, from the hyper paper uh, that you guys was assigned to read today, they claim it's not, it's not even worth it. You're better off trying to do better estimations on, on, on this, because this is a more dominating factor than just like, I predicted 10 cache misses and I really had 20. Right? The, dif the difference in performance of that is, is just not worth it. Um, it's sort of like if you have, if you're trying to measure what the performance of the system on the outside, latency sort of, cap, you know, latency of a query or transaction sort of captures or is an umbrella for pretty much all the other, you know, lower, lower, lower metrics, right? Latency would tell me how many cache misses I possibly have. If I have a higher latency, then I can infer I have more cache misses, right? So this is sort of a catch-all in the same way. All right, so again, so the small base one is kind of interesting. They have this two-phase thing, but again, nobody actually does this in, pra in practice. Okay, so if we're going to go with the number of tuples that are processed and emitted per, per operator, there's three factors we've got to talk about that uh, will, will affect this, this number. So the first is obviously the access method that we're going to use on, on the table, right? So if you're doing a sequential scan, you're, you're going to have to scan all the tuples, but if there's an index that you can use for your predicate, then that can reduce the number of, of, of items you have to look at significantly. Then we also have to deal with the distribution of the values in the database's attributes, right? If we have a million values and all, they're all the same, or, or a million tuples and they all have the same value for this, this one attribute, then we know we're gonna you know, push up a million tuples. But if everyone is single unique, then it's one over a million uh, for, for, what we're gonna, for, for a particular query that's doing a straight lookup on it. And sort of related in the same way, uh, connected to this, the number of tuples we plan on processing also depends on the predicate that we're using in the query. 
if it's like, uh, again, if it's an equality predicate on a, on a primary key, then we know we're going to get one tuple. But if it's a sequential scan uh, with, you know, a, in a range, and most of the tuples are emitted in that range, then we're going to generate a lot of tuples. So in our cost model, we're going to try to estimate all of these things, because that's going to tell us how many tuples we're going to process and how many tuples we're going to generate. So again, for easy queries, this is not hard to do, right? Primary key where ID equals four, uh, and I do a lookup, I'm going to get one tuple. But for subqueries, for things that have dependencies, for things that are um, generated from a nested query, then th this is really challenging. Um, and as we'll see as we go along, all the major database systems are, are really bad at this. All right, so the, the, we have to define some terms in order to show how we can calculate the, uh, the number of tuples. The first is the, the selectivity uh, of an operator. And we'll just define this to be the percentage of tuples that will be satisfied or be generated or selected uh, on our table based on a particular predicate. And what we'll do is in our database system, in our, in our cost model, we'll just model th this selectivity factor as just a probability. Right, because we can say like prob you know selectivity of 0 0.2 means 20% of the tuples will be satisfied for a uh, particular um, predicate. And so the way we're going to generate these is through using a variety of internal statistics that the database system is going to maintain about the database. So you can have domain constraints like you know the the, the min and max ranges for your type and another and other factors. Uh, you can maintain min and max statistics so you know what the lowest value and the highest value is. Um, a lot of times you see this in the disk-based database systems. You usually maintain uh, aggregated or you pre-compute aggregations for blocks of, uh, of, of tuples so that you don't have to decompress the entire thing. So for a particular block, you know the min and max, and therefore you can use that in your predicate to decide whether you need to bother looking at the tuples inside of it. And the last one that's probably the, 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 the most useful for us is to maintain histograms. Right? So this is going to be histograms about the distribution of the values for each individual attribute, and we'll maintain it for every single column. Um, usually what happens is that we'll, we'll probably make the assumption that the distribution of values, for the most part, are always going to be uniform, but then we'll try to identify some of the, the, the most common values and have more fine-grained details of them. So if we have the selectivity, then we can compute the result cardinality. And the cardinality is the number of tuples that we're going to generate for a particular operator based on the predicate, the access path, and the distribution of these values. Right? And this is simply just taking the selectivity and multiplying by the number of tuples that are fed into, fed into the operator. So the cardinality is really hard to get right. Um, and all the database systems have problems with this because they make the following three assumptions. So the first assumption is that they're going to assume that the distribution of the data is uniform. So what that means is that they're going to assume that for every unique value you have in your, in your, your column or your attribute, it's cur it, it, is, it, will, cur it will, can occur in, in a tuple with the same probability as all other values, except for the heavy hitters. So this is where they track the values that occur most often, so you can have more fine-grained information about how many tuples you have with them. So that way, again, for the most of the times you have a predicate that access them, you, it, you know what, what the distribution is going to be. You know what the, car, the, the cardinality is going to be. But for everyone else, you just assume they occur equally likely. Um, and this obviously doesn't, you know, in, in real workloads, this doesn't always hold true. And we'll see how this has problems later on. So the way you usually keep track of the heavy hitters is to use like, a, like a, an approximate data structure, like a Kalman sketch. So that way you're not tracking exactly how many tuples have, but you have a good idea of what the range is. The next assumption they're going to make is that the predicates in the query are all going to be independent. Right? So that means that if you have a conjunction statement in, in your where clause, the, the, each of those two predicates have their own selectivity, which is a probability. And therefore, by the rule of statistics, you can take those two probabilities and multiply them together. And that gives you the, what you think is the true selectivity of the entire where clause. And I will show an example in a second of why this doesn't always hold true. And the reason why they do this is simply because they just change, usually they don't have information about how column values related, are related to each other, so you just assume that they're independent. And the last assumption is that 
we're going to assume that the the join keys for for an inner relation and the outer relation uh, will always overlap. So for every key that's in your inner relation, it's guaranteed to exist in the join keys of the outer relation. Now, if you have a foreign key, this certainly always holds to be true because you can't have something in the child table uh, that doesn't exist in the parent table. But you're not always going to be joining on foreign keys, right? So this will be a problematic because it, it, you're assuming that the, every single value in the inner table exists in the outer table, when it may, and it may not always be the case. So an example of how the independent assumption breaks and the uniformity assumption breaks as well, uh, I always like to show this, this example that came from Guy Lohman, the guy who did the uh, Starburst paper we talked about last class. All right, so consider a database that has a bunch of tuples of automobiles. And the unique number of makes we can have are 10. All right, so this is your Honda, Ford, Chrysler. And then the number of models we have can be 100. So like, you know, Accord, Camry, um, Corolla. Those are all Japanese cars. That's OK. Uh, and say we have, we have a query where we can do a lookup, find all the automobiles where the make equals Honda and the model equals Accord. So if we assume that we make the assumption we made in the last slide that our data is, or is, is un uniformly distributed and all our predicates are independent, then the selectivity of this, this predicate here is 1 over 10, because it's 1 over uh, the number of makes, right? Because we're doing an equality predicate, so we know the only one we're looking for, multiplied by 1 over 100. Same thing. It's an equality predicate on the models, and we're looking for exactly 1. So this would give us 0 0.001. But since we know that these two fields are actually correlated, we know that only Honda makes accords, so we don't even need this, this part of the clause here, right? We just need to model what this is. So in that case, the true selectivity is just 0 0.01, right? And this is, this is pretty far off from what, from, from, you know, this is pretty far from this. So if you had like 10 million tuples, this thing would select like 1,000, where this one would select 100,000, right? So your order of magnitude uh, difference in what the true selectivity is. And this is why this is really hard to do and get accurate estimates in your, in, in your cost model. And as we'll see in a second, this, this is problematic when, when you're trying to determine the join order. So one way to get around this problem, and this is, is, is to use what are called column group statistics or attribute group, group statistics. And this is a feature that's mostly found, actually only found in the commercial guys. And basically what happens is you as the DBA can say, I know that these two columns are correlated. Therefore, don't compute statistics on them individually. Compute statistics on them together. Right? So now in that case of the, of the, the make and model thing, it would know that the, the make is correlated to the model and vice versa. So, or the model is correlated to the make, and therefore it, it knows how to choo choose, the, choo choose the correct uh, selectivity. So th this sounds awesome. This solves our problem. But the problem is that it's, 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 a, it's very manual. So you as the DBA have to tell the database system these columns, either pairs of columns or either some, some combination of them, and in what order are correlated. And therefore, you should maintain group statistics on them. Uh, so again, this is what you sort of pay a DBA a lot of money to do, to look, to look at your database and try to determine uh, when this occurs and provide hints to the database system so that the optimizer can make a better selection. Yes? So this question is, can the database system try to find correlations in the background? Yes, it can. I mean, it's very computationally expensive, right? So it's, I mean, it's not only are you looking at sort of exponential number of, of attributes, you're looking at a re, you know, possibly a really, really large data set. Um, so like when you call like analyze like in Postgres, it just goes down for every single column. I, you know, I, I actually don't know what the, the commercial guys, and maybe the newer versions can, can do this automatically. Um, but when it first came out, it was, it was, it was, it was manual. OK. So let's look. Sorry, yes, go ahead. Yeah, you know, actually, yeah. So his question is, if you have a query that has a user-defined function, a UDF, how does the database system calculate statistics? You know what? I should have talked about this. Uh, you can't do anything, right? They treat the UDF as a black box. It doesn't know what it's actually going to do. It doesn't know anything about selectivity and things like that. Um, 
And so I think for the most part, everyone just gives up, throws their hands up. And they probably have some constant where they, they select something that like, yeah, this looks good enough. So, so in your case of the UDS, it's like, just take some tuples in and produce some tuples. Yeah, so uh, there's two types of UDS. One can take a, uh, one can take a set of, tu set of tuples and produce, I think, a, a scalar. Another can take a set of tuples and produce m uh, uh, another set of tuples. But the basic idea, yeah, you're taking tuples in, you're doing some processing that would be very difficult to do in SQL. Yeah. Right? You can write UDFs in like PL SQL or SQL PSM. You can write uh, UDFs in like C, and then it forks out a call to that. Um, and you just have to write the, the, the take the input in a particular format and generate an output in the correct format. Sorry. So, so in that case, can we just take a sub, subset or take some sampling of the whole data set and run UDF from that? And so his question is, can you just take a uh, can you just take a sample of tuples, run the UDF on it, and uh, use that as, look at look at its output and use that to try to determine what the, the selectivity is. Uh, Yes, but if it's written in PL SQL, I think that there's no reason you couldn't do this because you can't write arbitrary code to do stuff inside of that. In, a, uh, in an external or sandbox UDF, you can write whatever you want. So you could have it send out emails every single time you, you, you invoke it, right? Uh, and I don't think the database system would, can't control that. So that usually it may, may not do that. Um, Actually, one way you could do this actually is uh, you can build what are called, um, uh, I forget what they call it, deterministic indexes. or Basically, you can build an index on a UDF, right? So you can say, for this table, for this attribute, build my index on the output that is generated by the UDF. And then what happens is when you want to go find your match, you t give for a given you know, probe on a key, you run the UDF on that, that gives you a value, and then you know how to you know, map into the indexes of the UDF values. In that case there, then you can derive a bunch of statistics that you could then use for the query optimizer. I don't think the open source guys do that, but the commercial guys might do that. Right, that's pretty complicated. Yeah, so in that case, when, whenever we insert a tuple, we need to run UDF on that tuple. And and insert into the index, so yeah. Basically we're adding Yeah, so, so yeah, there's a semantic debate of like, is an index, index is sort of like a materialized view. Uh, and in that, in that case, yes, you can think of the index as a materialized view, but it's in a B plus tree rather than a whole separate table. Uh, and it, it, would, it would give you the same thing. But then now you have the problem, right? If you, you need to be, have the, uh, you have to have him, your, your query planner recognize that you have a, UDF index, and they can use that in your, in your, in your query, query planning. Likewise, if you had a materialized view, it needs to know, oh, even though you asked to look at this table, but I see that you're doing, using UDF, well, I can really do this on the materialized view. All right. That's a whole other aspect we, we, we didn't talk about. But the UDFs is a good point. All right. All right, so just to give you a rough sketch of why having bad estimations is, is hard, especially when you have joins, we just take a simple query here. We're joining A, B, C, and we're not going to put in real values. We'll just talk about you know, how we do you know, cost estimation up the tree. So assume that we've, this is the plan that we picked. We're not going to try to do permutations of the join ordering. We're saying this is what we're going to go with. Let's talk about why this is hard. So in the first step, what you're going to do is you're going to compute the cardinality of accessing all the tuples from, from the base table here. Right? In the case of A, it's just a, the cardinality of A, and C is the same thing. But in case of B, uh, B ID is greater than 100, we would use our knowledge about, the, or about what the distribution is, is for this value to try to compute what the selectivity is, it is. And that'll tell us the number of tuples we're, we're going to plan to emit. But the join now is hard because now our joins are going to be derived from the estimates that we made here. So if our estimates are wrong in the lower parts, they get sort of uh, amplified as we go up the tree. Right? So in the case of this, doing the join A and B, it's taking the cardinality of, of these two guys, and actually that should be uh, this one here. Um, and then we're going to divide it by whatever has the, the highest selectivity between uh, A ID and B ID, and B ID is greater than, uh, greater than 100. Um, and then from that, we take the selectivity or the cardinality we generate from this, 
and that gets fed into the cardinality of that. So if we were wrong here, we'll be wrong here, and then even more wrong up here. So this is why, as we see now when we talk about the, the experiments that the hyper guys did with Postgres, this is why these things are widely off, because the, the, if your estimates are bad at the bottom, then they're just going to be bad everywhere else. Right? So this, this is, there's no easy way to get around this. I mean, we could, for every single query, just do you know, a, a complete scan of the table to compute exactly what the cardinality is going to be. So we'd have you know, absolute correctness all the way around. But then if we just did that, we might, might as well just execute the query. So we're trying to make some approximations about the, uh, what the data looks like we're going to access. But then the problem is, because we make all those assumptions about predicates and other things, that's why everything goes wrong. So to give you an example of just how, th th how wrong things get, the paper that I, got, I had you guys read, I actually really enjoyed because it just really gets down and dirty and says, look how terrible things are. Um, and so for the first experiment, what they're going to do is they're going to measure the correctness of the cardinality estimates that uh, a bunch of different database systems are generating. And they want to compare that to what the true cardinality is. So they developed this, this new workload, this new benchmark called the, the join ordering benchmark. And they would load the database in, invoke whatever the command you, did is you need to, to, to have the database system go collect statistics about the data. And then they would extract what the cardinality estimates are for each query plan, and then run the subset of the queries in, in regular SQL and see how, how much they deviate. And for this, they're going to compare five different database systems uh, that all produce the, the information that we need to make this uh, uh, comparison. And they're going to test this using 100,000 different queries. And the difference between what this job benchmark they're using versus like TPCH is that the job benchmark is derived from a real data set, and therefore it, ha it exhibits the skew patterns that we'd expect in a real workload. Whereas TPCH, it's because it's supposed to be this portable benchmark, they don't, they don't have any like, skew in it. Everything's perfectly uniform. So therefore, the query estimates, the, the cardinality, cardinality estimates we make kind of work out nicely. But in a real data set, it doesn't, doesn't turn out to be the case at all. So this graph here is showing the five different database systems that they compared. And along the x-axis for each one of them, they're increasing the number of joins that they're doing in, for each query. Right? So you're doing a two-table join, a three-way join, right? going across. Um, and then the way to read this is that this middle part here corresponds to when the cardinality estimates generated by their cost model exactly matches what the true cardinality is when, when, when they run their queries. Right, so you want to be in the middle here as much as possible. So what we see are, are three trends. So the first is you have whatever, this database system here is actually doing pretty well. Right? It's, it's deviating uh, a little bit as the number of joins increase, but it's not as bad as the other ones. And actually, an overall trend for all of these is that they always are underestimating the, the, the cardinality for all these queries. That's because they're assuming that the predicates are uh, independent, and therefore the selectivity estimate is, you know, super restrictive when it actually shouldn't be. The second thing we, so the second other trend we see is that for these three database systems here, they all sort of degrade in the same way as you increase the number of joins, but they sort of de degrade evenly going from, uh, you know, go going from one join size to the next. And this one here actually does, does a little bit worse than the other ones, but they all sort of look, look roughly the same. And then you got this guy in the middle here where immediately, even after three joins, it just, the, the variance in its, in its correctness is it's way off. Right? Um, and actually does worse than, than all the other ones. So in the paper, they told you that this one was Postgres and that the last one was Hyper. But then we take a guess what these three are. All right, let's pick the easy one. This one's the worst. What do we think this is? What's that? He says DB2. He says, he says MySQL. Anybody else? He says Oracle. All right, and then you have these two guys here. Uh, they're sort of degrading. This, this one actually performs the best out of all of them. They don't take a guess what this one is. He says DB2. He says SQL Server. Anybody else? 
All right, SQL Server, Oracle, DB2. <laughs> um, and part of this is that uh, when they talk about the, I mean, SQL, like I said, SQL Server is very, very good. And they have some really awesome people working on it. Um, the, there's nothing about other what they're doing. I mean, they don't really say what they're doing to make this so much better. They talk about how they do sort of the same sampling technique to, to estimate the, 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 the selectivity of predicates that Hyper does rather than relying on statistics. I mean, DB2 and Oracle support the column group statistics, but I don't think they tune the system to do that. Um, this sort of gets into like the black art of database systems, right? This is like the optimizer is one of the key differentiators between like what a commercial, commercial system can do versus what an open source system can do. And there's a lot of secret sauce in this that, are, that, that they're using to make this go, go better that they're probably you know, not documented anywhere. Um, maybe it's in a patent, I don't know. But it's, so it's just, they're doing a very good job at collecting statistics and I don't think it's just the sampling thing that the hyper guys talk about. All right, so now, so this is basically showing that the cardinality estimates for all these database systems are wildly off and they're always underestimating what they think the, the, the number of tuples you're going to have to process per operator. So now uh, what they did was they went to Postgres and they want to see, well, how bad are the query plans that the optimizer is going to generate when you have really bad statistics, uh, when you're making bad estimates. And so the way to read this graph here is it's the slowdown of, the, of each query uh, compared to the query you would generate when you have true cardinality estimates. So what they did was, which is really cool, they went to Postgres and they injected like hooks in, the, in the, the cost model so that when they were generating a query plan, rather than doing, looking at the statistics and computing an estimate, they would feed in what the actual true value was, right? They would pre-compute everything and give exact numbers to the optimizer. So now what they're showing here along the x-axis is this is the percentage of queries that they tested that uh, grouped by the slowdown that they experienced versus the true estimate query, right? So uh, over here, you see that 60% of the queries are slowed down by what, 20%, by up, up to 20% more up to, to 100, 100x, right? So this is pretty significant. This is showing that if your estimates are way off, you could be 100x slower than what the, you know, the best query or the best query plan would do. So what they found was, uh, and this is why I like this paper, because they really get down to the details of what the optimizer in Postgres was doing. What they found was for these guys over here is that because they're underestimating the number of tuples that they expect the operator to process, then they were choosing suboptimal algorithms. So when the, since it was underestimating how many tuples it was, it would always start choosing the nested loop, in, uh, nested loop joins, right? Because I, this, you can think of it as like the, the nested loop, since it's just two for loops, you don't have to set up any hash tables, you don't have to do any sorting, you don't have to, to, to copy data around. So if you assume that the result set is going to be really, really small, then you, then it's just better to do those two for loops, All right? But in practice, so, so so if they, the next thing they did was they went to the optimizer and disabled it from selecting the nested loop join, and they run it again, and now you see that things have gotten a lot better. So you still have some queries that are about 100x slower, but it's not as many as you had here, and most of your queries now are around, um, uh, you know, within 10% you know, of, the, of the true speed. So now they looked at this and said, well, what's the problem? What's, what's going on? If we're only doing hash joins, why is this still, everything still slow here? And what they found was is that in this version of Postgres they were using, the, the execution engine would rely on the cardinality estimates that were being generated by the, the, the cost model to uh, allocate the size of the hash table that you would use for, the, for your hash join. So what happened is because you're now underestimating the size of your result set for your hash table, you, you would allocate a small hash table, but then you would have these really long collision chains because you know, there's more tuples than you anticipated. So in Postgres 9.5, which I don't think is out yet, uh, they have a new version that, that has, can dynamically allocate or resize the hash table during query processing. So if now if, you're, if you realize your hash table is getting too full, you can reshuffle things around and resize it and not worry about these long, long chains. So they backported that patch from 9.5 to, to 
And now what you see is that most of the queries here are within 20% of, of the, the optimal query. So like you know, 60 plus, plus 35. So 90% of the queries are, are almost as good as it would be if you had the true estimate. Right? So the main takeaway for this is that uh, the lessons that they provide in the paper is that the having a um, having you know these really accurate cost models uh, doesn't really help you. Or having a cost model that's really fine grained and get to the low level details of the metrics that the that the database system is going to execute as as it executes the plan is not nearly necessary. And that you're better off doing uh, having better cardinality estimates. And so these are the sort of four rules that the the hyper guy sent me. The main takeaways that, that they want that they got out of this paper. So the first thing he says is that query optimization, right, of selecting good join orders is more important than just having a really fast execution engine. So even though you're maybe in main, in main memory and you can process things very quickly, uh, if your query optimizer is generating bad plans, you're going to be executing bad plans very quickly, right? So you, you, it's very important to get the join order correct. And the next takeaway is that. The cardinality estimates are usually wrong. Um, so you want to make sure that all your operator implementations do not rely on anything that the optimizer tells you. Right? In that case, that hash table, don't rely on that the, that the optimizer says, I'm, you're going to process 10 tuples, because there may be a million tuples. You should have all your, your, your data structures and implementation be able to dynamically react as, it, as it's going along. Another interesting uh, takeaway they have is that they said trying to do more uh, Trying to rely on indexes to cut down on the, uh, the number of tuples you have to process is kind of a pain because when you have more indexes and you have more choices now for the cost opt optimizer to make, uh, what access path to use, uh, it ends up uh, coming up with even more wrong estimates that then percolate up, up into the tree. So you're often just better off just doing a brute force sequential scan on the entire table and just doing a, you know, using a really fast hash join implementation. So even though you could use an index and jump to a particular you know, subset of tuples and process just those, it might just be better to, again, like a pickup truck, just go through everything. And then the last piece I think is cool is that they basically said, trying to have a more accurate model, like in the small base example that we talked about before, is usually a waste of time. All right? And just guessing the number of tuples you're going to process, but having those guesses be accurate is, is, it will give you more bang for the buck. Okay, so uh, the again the main takeaway from all, from the query optimization stuff is that I think the volcano cascade search strategy that we talked about last class paired together with a cost estimator based on the number of tuples that are going to be processed and emitted per operator is like the right way to go. And as far as I can tell, I mean I don't know what search strategy a bunch of different database systems use, uh, but for the most part they all use the number of tuples as as the main metric. Right, because that's a good approximation, a good enough approximation for, for, for most queries. So any questions about cost models and estimations? Okay. So let's jump into sort of this this you know other topic again that I think is kind of important for you guys. That's not directly rated just to database systems, but again, I think it should help you throughout your, your entire career. Um, so I want to start to talk about like things you need to be be mindful of and consider when you start working on a really large code base. I mean, you guys have already started on this in project number three, but when you leave CMU, that you're going to you're going to encounter this uh, uh, over and over again. So just a quick disclaimer: I'm obviously uh, you know I'm not like a grizzled you know 25 year veteran in in software development. But in my life, I have actually worked on two database systems uh, and one very large distributed system, the, the batch processing system. Uh, so I've, I've spent some time working on really large code bases. You know, when I was in grad school, I worked on HDOR for you know, five or six years, and that thing got pretty big. Uh, in addition to working on these systems, I've actually read a large amount of what I'll call enterprise code for uh, some legal work I've done over the years as well. Right? I can't name names, but I've looked at what, what you know, from, from a major software vendor, I've looked at their code for, you know, for a year or two to really try to understand it and be able to you know, write about it um, in litigation. So 
I'm not claiming everything that I'm saying about is, is gospel. You know, take everything I say with a grain of salt. And I'm not claiming to be, you know, super knowledgeable in exactly how, you know, when you go to Google, how they want you to, you know, work on the software and things like that. So I'm just talking about high level things that have helped me in these different facets of my life that I think actually are, um, should be, you know, for useful for you guys. And I'll also say too, there's not going to be like this magic product. You know, they're not going to recommend you go, you know, spend a thousand dollars from IntelliJ and get some software that's magically going to solve all your problems and make it super easy to work on, uh, to work to work on, you know, large 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 projects. I'm just trying to have you guys be mindful of and think about these things when you go out into the real world and leave CMU. That these are some of the, the approaches you can take, um, rather than just, you know, throwing your hands up. So the, the main thing you've got to be mindful of is that you are almost never going to start working on a new project from scratch. Right? Even if you're building a new database system from scratch, there's still going to be libraries and things like that that you want to incorporate that you don't want to have to write yourself. So there's always going to be a really large code base that you didn't write and you don't know the person who wrote it. And there may, there may not be any documentation on what it's actually doing and why it's written the way it's written. So you need to be able to be able to like be very independent and, and just sit down with it and start to make sense of it, right? And the reason why I think this is important is because when I've been planning this course for the last year or so, I would talk to all these you know senior level people at, at database developers, uh, and I always ask them like you know I'm teaching this new class, it can be database internals. What do you guys like? If someone graduates from CMU and you want to hire them. What's the one sort of skill you think is really important for them to learn? Like, do, you want to, do you want them to be masters in concurrent control and locking? Do you want them to know SIMD, LLVM? Do you want them to know, you know um, B plus trees? And without me prompting them and without like, me you know, telling them what other people have told me, they all said the same thing. They all said they want students that can take a really large code base and dive into it and start working on it and, and, and making contributions right away and be very independent about it. And actually, I won't name names, but there's actually a uh, database company that the, when you go interview with them, the, the, their, test, or their, their coding test is to give you memcache and tell you to add a new feature to it. So they, don't, they, don't, you know, they don't sell memcache. Uh, they don't expect you to know memcache. They say, here's a large code base. Go add some feature into it. And they tell me that this is the number one this is the number one indicator of whether someone's going to be good or not at their company, is whether they can pass that memcache test. So part of this, again, that's, that's a little bit different because you're trying to work on something within a, in a constrained amount of time. But again, just be mindful of, of, of this is a skill that you should definitely work on. And again, there's no magic button. I can only talk about what has worked for me. So I would say also, too, that like, the first thing people would usually want to do when they want to start working in a large code base is that they just start reading it just sort of for the sake of reading it. Um, and this is usually a waste of time, because you're just reading it without any direction about what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you're not going to internalize what, what is actually going on in the code. Right? You may get a big picture of things, but when it gets time to actually really understand the, the, the details that are important, you're not going to be able to grasp this just from reading it. And I also say, too, in, in my own experience in managing students working on projects, uh, a lot of times, you know, I'll tell a student, you know, work on this project and come back in a week and tell me what you've done. Uh, the ones that come back and say, oh, I was just reading the code, aren't, don't turn out to be very good. It's the ones that actually come back and say, hey, look, I, I wrote this little code. It's, it may not be perfect yet, but I at least started. Um, so I think it's important to, uh, if you really want to really understand, you've got to start mucking around with the code. Right? That's the only way you're going to be able to, to fully comprehend what's going on. So there's two ways to do this. Uh, the, the first case is the first way to do it is to write test cases, right? And I, when I say test cases, I mean like unit tests that actually invoke the functions in the actual program itself, and not regression tests that are testing a high level functionality, right? That may not, you know, call the thing that call the function of the part of the code that you're looking at. Um, the nice thing about this is that if it's going to force you to understand the what the code is actually doing, um, because if your test case fail fails, hopefully you know, the, the, the program is correct and your test case is incorrect, it'll force you to understand what the inputs and outputs that are, you're expecting to get from these different parts of the code that you're, you know, that you're dealing with. And it's also not kind of nice, too, because you earn kudos for people, your, your coworkers, and the people that are working with you on this project, because no one ever complains when there's new test cases. Obviously, if your test case computes pi to the billionth digit and takes 20 hours to run, people will be pissed. 
uh, but in general, no, you know, more tests are always a, a better thing. So the nice thing about this doing test cases as well is that uh, it's, you're writing code, you're interacting with the system, but you're not actually touching the, the functionality of the system. So that prevents you from making doing any real damage. Like if your test case is broken, that doesn't affect the, the actual system itself. So this is usually a good way to get started. And then another thing that I, I find useful as well is to, to do refactoring. So this is sort of finding the, the location of the code you plan on working on and want to get started with and just start cleaning it up. Right? Changing, fixing variable names, fixing comments, uh, maybe break out logic that's in one function and it, you know, it's one giant function to, to subparts. Because right? again, this is a nice easy way without having to think about how do I ax, add a new complex feature or fix a bug that I'm not surely, really sure where, where it is yet. Uh, it allows you to you know, get your hands dirty with the code without you know, exerting mental effort to truly understand it yet. And this again, the more you sort of do this and, get, and you get more comfortable with everything, and now you understand what the different parts are, because these are the parts that you wrote uh, or that you've been working with, you can then expand to that now adding, you know, adding whatever it is that you want to add. The only thing I'll say about this is that you have to be careful, about the, careful when you do this, because obviously you're not as familiar with the code as, as you would be later on, so therefore you may not want to make a change that would, could, you know, could, could affect correctness. All right, so then the last piece is that, in, and this is something that we really don't talk about, I think, in CS courses, is that you know, starting off on a new project, working on a large code base, is not more than just the code itself. It's also all the mechanisms and the build processes and the, and the, and the tools that, that are going to be used to build it. And so the, I think it's really important also to understand what the protocol that the organization is using to build the software and become familiar with that and understand that if I submit code, where does it, what happens to it? What's the life cycle of that change? When, how does it get tested? Where does it get tested? Who tests it? Uh, how does it get reported? Um, all of these things I think are really important as well. So at you know, bigger companies and, and, and even you know, well-run startups, They'll either have, they'll probably have on-site training to say like, you know, here's how, you, here's how we do it here. You need to sort of follow the same protocol. Um, you know, Google is notorious for having all their source code in one giant repository tree. Um, and then there'll probably also be documentation as well to say what our coding standard is, what the, um, you know, how do you write tests, where the tests should go, and things like that. So one way to get more familiar with all these things, if the documentation is not available or they're not going to provide you training, is just start writing it yourself. Right? And because then it's going to force you to, in order to write down your thoughts on what you need to do to build the software, you have to actually truly understand it. Right? The best way to learn something is actually try to teach it. So again, this is something if you write documentation, assuming there isn't a tech writer already, this is something that nobody will complain about if you do. Because it's sort of helping everyone and makes it easier for the next person to come along and pick up where you left off. So any questions about this? So like I said, this is sort of maybe seem kind of obvious. Uh, it's just, I want you guys to think about these things Again, either for this project or the next project, you know, when you, when you leave this class, of trying to be very independent when it comes to, to, to writing code. Right? Nobody likes it if you, you, know, you, you write some code, it crashes, and then you immediately throw your hands up and try to ask your manager or, or your peer why, do, why this doesn't work. Okay? All right, so next class, we will talk about query compilation. So the way to think about compilation is that the, the query plan itself would then will be executed directly rather than interpreted. So the hash join that you guys wrote was, it was an example of an interpreted hash join. Right? We took a query plan, we fed it into an executor, and then we parsed it and figured out what we actually need to do. But in query compilation, there is no interpretation. We just immediately execute our join. And so we'll see, we'll see how we do this in Hyper and, and a few other systems. OK? Any other questions? All right, well, guys, we're done. Thank you. <laughs>